Howdy. Hey, everyone. Aaron Boster here, and thanks for learning about MS with me. It's March, and as you know, I've committed to live streaming as much as possible to help energize, educate, and to help empower people impacted by MS. So um, hopefully some folks are going to jump online, and I've got several questions that people have written into me for, uh, answers I'm about to provide. So 16 people are getting online. Let me just write a howdy, y'all. As you jump on, hey, Scotty, how are you? Hello, Elizabeth. Um, as you jump online, please share with me where you're calling in from. Uh, as uh, I've said in the past, I love this uh, growing online community. We just hit 9,000 subscribers. That blows my mind. Uh, I never thought I would have 9,000 subscribers. Uh, and you guys uh, really have shown me something special um, in the comments and here in the live streams, the interactions I get to have with you and the interactions amongst yourselves are phenomenal. So thank you. Um, I'm going to be reading some questions that people have written in and providing answers. As I've mentioned in previous live streams, this is works in progress. Uh, please write in your questions uh, in, the, in the comments right now. I will review them after uh, this live stream is over uh, and I'll answer them in the next one. So let's jump in. So, um, so uh, a viewer named Wassel, uh, W-I-S-S-A-L, I hope I'm not saying your name wrong, writes, Hi, I love your videos so much. Uh, can you talk about uh, what we can do to help avoid developing MS? So that's a great question. And so Wassel is saying, are there things that one can do to lower their risk? And there are. Um, it looks like low levels of vitamin D, particularly pre-puberty, um, increase the risk to develop MS. And there's a thought that supplementing vitamin D pre-puberty might uh, in improve the chances or lower the risk. So that's one thing you can do. The second thing is children who are morbidly obese are at increased risk of developing MS. And so uh, yet another reason <clears throat> why it's a good idea to be physically fit and in specific not to be morbidly obese. There's some question about vitamin D, excuse me, about um, salt, uh, but I don't really think that's gospel yet. The biggest one, however, is avoiding tobacco smoke. So tobacco increases the risk to develop MS. So in quick summary, things that one can do to lower their risk to develop MS, one would be to avoid tobacco, and that's really the biggest one. Supplement low levels of vitamin D, particularly pre-puberty, and then to avoid morbid obesity. So that was a great question. Thank you. And by the way, this is not a commercial. Uh, this is just the bottle that I'm using to drink water out of. Um, if you guys want to play along when I drink, you drink. Uh, that way we get our water in. Next question. So Keith writes in and says, here exercising on my bike with you in my headphones. And that's so cool. Um, that's not really a question, but I left it in because I wanted to comment. I never thought about that. I never thought that maybe someone would listen into the live stream or listen to a video while they were doing something else. So that's super cool. If any of you guys do that, if you might listen to the channel, either the live stream or, or the videos uh, while you're doing something else, leave a comment below because I would like to read about that. Now, that's really neat. And Keith, thank you for that. And I hope you had a good workout. So Bogart the Stingy writes in, how does rheumatoid arthritis affect people with MS? So rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disease that affects certain joints of the hand uh, and other areas, other limbs. And it can be uh, very, very painful. It can literally deform the joint and therefore deform the limb. Um, and so rheumatoid arthritis is a, a nasty autoimmune condition. It's a treatable condition. Uh, and oftentimes people with rheumatoid arthritis are followed by rheumatologists. Now, it's an autoimmune condition, and MS is an autoimmune condition. And we know that if you have one autoimmune condition, you're more likely to get a second. So I do have some patients that actually have both multiple sclerosis and rheumatoid arthritis. Now, Bogart the Stingy is asking, how does rheumatoid arthritis impact people with MS? And as my mentor uh, liked to say, sometimes nature's too generous. And you can have one autoimmune disease that's affecting the brain and spinal cord, optic nerves, and then another autoimmune disease that's impacting the joints. Um, and that's yucky, but it can happen. One really interesting comment, though, there are some medicines that literally treat both. So there's a medicine uh, for multiple sclerosis called uh, Abagio, and there's a medicine for rheumatoid arthritis called Areva. 
And when you swallow a pill of Areva and it hits your stomach and is digested, the first metabolite is actually a Baggio. And so really you're kind of using the same medicine to treat two different autoimmune conditions. Also, there's a medicine called rituximab, which is used to treat rheumatoid arthritis. And it's also successful in treating MS. Rituximab is a cousin of Ocrevus. My point here is that there are some similarities in the treatments. Um, hopefully that helps Bogart the Stingy. Thank you for asking. Second swig of water. So Vicky writes in, could you explain how, when you decide to de-escalate disease modifying therapies in the, in the de-escalation model? Vicky, thank you for uh, that question. I love your questions. Um, now, I, I put out a video uh, maybe a couple months ago. Actually, it was like right around Christmas time uh, on the de-escalation model and my prediction that people would embrace a de-escalation model in the future. That would be the future of the way we treat MS. It, presently, there isn't an accepted de-escalation protocol. And so you can't uh, look it up or look up a consensus statement where a bunch of neurologists treating a mess said, oh, here's how you do it. We don't have something like that. This is a conceptual theoretical thing. Now, I uh, adhere to this. I really like this idea. But at, at present, it's a case by case thing. So me as the doctor sitting across the table from, from my partner, the patient, together, we're figuring out how we're doing this. And there isn't an algorithm that I can apply at present to say, ooh, this is the time that you do it. I would suggest that the first half of the disease is way more likely to be pro-inflammatory. And uh, as I explained in that de-escalation video, I would want to hit it really, really hard up front for quite some time. Now, in the second half of the disease, uh, when there's less statistical likelihood of having attacks or new spots, that would be a time that you might be able to de-escalate. But I can't say with great certainty exactly when that time is, and I wouldn't want to give you that impression. Um, more to come, Vicki. I really do think that this is going to be the future of the way that we manage MS. Uh, and so it's my hope that we explore it further through research, um, and, we'll, and we'll see. Tune in. So Bluth Dunn writes, is depression a symptom of MS? Of, well, excuse me. Is depression a symptom of MS? Or would it be a comorbidity? And the answer is yes. People with MS are twice as likely to experience depression compared to the general population. And I think some of that is because there's active unchecked inflammation in the brain that's causing depression. I also think the nature of the um, unknown of the disease, you know, will I have an attack tomorrow, creates a, a degree of anxiety and, and can contribute to depression. So I definitely think that MS uh, can cause depression and that it's, depression can be a symptom of, of MS. Now, it also might be considered a comorbidity. Comorbidity is a doctor word um, when you're trying to describe relationships and other conditions that may uh, line up next to each other. And so I really feel like it could be described as either. And I think both are probably ultimately true. Now, there's 102 people online right now. That's amazing. Thank you, guys. Thank you very, very much. Um, I'm, I'm looking at the side, people from Nicaragua, people from Mississippi, people from Seoul. That's just so awesome. Thank you all for being online. Now, I don't know if, has any of you noticed uh, this boo-boo that I got today? Um, I don't know if any of you noticed earlier, but I'll get close so you can see. Um, I, I got this boo-boo. So it's spring break time, uh, and I took the kids uh, to a water park. And I don't normally participate in the water parks. Uh, normally I hang out, um, and this time I was talked into going on a water ride. And I haven't been on a, on a water slide in quite some time, but I went. And I got up to the top, and the lady said, hey, look, you can't really go down with your glasses on. So, well, I'm so blind without my glasses that I leave them on all the time except when sleeping. So I said, okay, well, I'll just take them off and I'll hold them, which I did. And I took them off and then I had to sit down so I could go in this ride. And without my glasses on, I couldn't see where I was. And I smacked my head against the top of the, the tube. So I went down. I didn't know that I was bleeding. And, and I went down the slide, which was fun. And when I got out, my, uh, my kids were standing there. And my son had this look of terror on his face. He said, are you okay? I said, yeah. He said, are you sure you're bleeding? And I, so anyway, so I thought that was kind of funny. Um, it teaches me uh, right for taking my glasses off. Uh, at any rate, let me jump back into some questions, guys. Dan McGee writes, uh, I'm going to send you a question uh, hopefully you can answer. So, Dan, I'm going to do that right now. 
Um, do you recommend a probiotic when your white count is 0.7? And my doc has put me on antibiotics. Um, so Dan, that's a great question. Pro, I, I have a video on the microbiome and the gut brain connection. And in that video, I talk about probiotics. It's not my opinion uh, that probiotics in, uh, can impact MS in a way that we can control yet. I do think the microbiome, which is all the bacteria that live in your gut, impact the immune system. I think that data is pretty decent. And I do think that taking probiotics can change that gut flora, um, but I don't think we know how to do that yet. I, I think that probiotics today can be recommended to help control regularity. And many patients that embrace taking probiotics have marked improvement in their bowel function. And so that's a situation where I may recommend it to a patient. I'm personally not concerned about someone taking a probiotic um, when their white count is low. The bacteria that they're taking in are not thought to be toxic to the human body. On the contrary, they're supposed to be like a good uh, colonies of bacteria. And so uh, if my patient had a low white count, I personally uh, wouldn't view that as a concern. Now, I'm not giving you medical advice. And so, Dan, you can't take what I'm saying and say, oh, well, Dr. B said, right, because I'm just talking in generalities. If I had a patient um, who had a low white count and wanted a probiotic, I'm telling you that I'd probably be okay with it. But there's a, lot, a couple other things that one might need to consider. So I hope that helps answer your question. I appreciate you asking it. Water time. So Becky Perry writes in, is it possible to have a true exacerbation if the MRI states that it's stable? Am I just crazy? So I'll answer that question backwards. I'll answer the first part. No, you're not crazy. Uh, Becca, it is possible to have an attack without it showing up on the MRI. Uh, I believe that. Um, first of all, not all MRIs capture everything. The vast majority of MRIs of the brain have gaps in them, and so you're missing some tissue. And oftentimes we're getting a brain MRI, but we didn't get the full spine. And so if you're not imaging from stem to stern, first of all, you may not even be catching something that is there. That being said, uh, people have had MS attacks long before MRIs existed. And I think that it is possible to have an MS attack. If I see new, uh, if I hear about new neurological deficits, and I examine someone and find a, a clear-cut objective evidence on exam that, that buttresses what they're telling me. Uh, first of all, I don't need an MRI because I already have the answer. If I got an MRI and I didn't see anything, I wouldn't um, un unthink what I thought. I wouldn't say, oh, well, the exam doesn't count now um, because it still counts. And the, the history is not real because it is. And so I, I don't think you're crazy, and I think it is possible. Good question. Divine Misery writes in, hey, Divine, I hope you're doing well. I love your participation on the channel. Thank you. Um, writes in, question, I recently watched a video uh, of a lecture from a doctor from MS Views, uh, I believe who stated that taking steroids in pill form compared to IV um, has the same therapeutic relief thoughts. So the answer is it's true. Now, Divine, I'm going to unpack your question a little bit. Um, MS Views and News is a really cool website by a buddy of mine named uh, Stuart Sloshman. Uh, Stuart has MS, and he's the president and founder of MS Views and News. And if you guys haven't checked out his channel, you should because it's unbelievable. He literally goes around the country and does lectures with the who's who in MS, talking about what they're passionate about, what they're good at. And so he has this giant repository of videos a really amazing MSologist from around the country. Uh, so Stu's a great guy. MSV is news is awesome. And that's what she's referencing. Um, the comment is, hey, you know, do IV steroids work the same or as well as oral? And the answer is yes, they do. Now, when we say oral steroids, I'm not talking about 20 milligrams of prednisone. Um, let me explain this to you. When you take IV steroids for an attack, you're taking a thousand milligrams, one zero 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 milligrams uh, of IV solumedro. When you take oral, in order to have the same bioequivalence, meaning for it to be the same in your body, you need one thousand two hundred and fifty milligrams, one two zero or one two five zero milligrams, and it comes in fifty milligram tablets, prednisone. So, in order to take the appropriate dose of oral prednisone, you're taking 25 50 milligram tablets, for real. Now, people sometimes think that's crazy, but it's been studied extensively. There's actually a Cochrane Review article. Now, for those of you that aren't familiar, Cochrane Reviews are these very, very um, 
important meta-analyses that are done where they look at all the data and then they make a statement. And they almost never find anything to be uh, uh, like positive. This was one of the rare instances where they demonstrated through this meta-analysis in the Cochrane Review that oral was equally as safe and effective and as well tolerated as IV, which is really cool because IVs are expensive and they take a long time um, and they can be you know, slightly uncomfortable. And they have to be done either with an infusion nurse in the home or at an infusion center. Pills are way cheaper, like $40 for an entire prescription in the United States. And you can take the pills at home. Now, there are some things that you have to keep in mind. I like to give people like an over-the-counter stomach protector, like a Pepsi or a Zantac or something. Um, and I want you to take all the pills in the morning with food. And taking it with food is really important. You don't want to space the pills out throughout the day. And so um, you also need, in any time you give someone high-dose steroids like this, you want to make sure they never had a history of bleeding ulcer um, or really bad uh, gastritis. You want to make sure that they haven't had psychosis with steroids. You want to make sure they, haven't, they don't have diabetes or uh, gestational diabetes. Those, so those are some things that you're always going to be checking. Uh, at any rate, uh, the short answer is yes, they're equal. So uh, Alexis uh, writes in, Oh, she, she writes in, oh, let me get my water bottle. So I really liked, um, it may have been divine, but a couple of people when I was on a live stream said, hey, I'm going to drink water when Dr. B drinks water. So I've got my bottle here. And if you're like me and you're not the best water drinker, um, it's important to try to improve. I have several videos on nutrition on this channel, and I have a, one video dedicated to the importance of drinking water. And I think I give like 10 reasons why it's a good idea to drink water. And then I give a bunch of tips on how to in, improve your water drinking. So maybe this is a fun way. Uh, we'll call it the water game. And when I drink, you drink. So Melanie Parker writes, if you haven't already, um, oh, she, she's uh, she's commenting about, I'm going to read this comment to you. She says, if you haven't already, everyone should check out Dr. Boster's video library. There's a lot of great topics and the playlists are well organized. Well, Melanie, thank you for saying that. And I, I'm curious how many of you know that I maintain this, uh, the, all these different playlists. So when I make a video on the channel, I try to include it in the playlist so people can go find it. Um, I don't know how easy it is to search through the, the channel. And so any of you that are tuned in right now, um, please give me a comment. Uh, let me know if, um, if you can find videos when you need them or if it's confusing or you get lost. I would love to know that. It's bittersweet test writes, optic neuritis relate, related to MS are flashes and flitters also. So uh, it's bittersweet test is uh, talking about three different eye problems. Um, optic neuritis, uh, where there's inflammation of the optic nerve and it causes pain with extraocular movement. So as you move your eyeball and diminished vision, this is part of optic neuritis. Optic neuritis is a pretty common MS symptom, actually, uh, and it can be treated. We use hydrosteroids to treat it. Now, flashes and floaters are typically not associated with MS. When I hear about floaters, I typically think about uh, debris in the eye that's in the vitreous that's literally floating by. And so you see this little squiggle, and that's what you're looking at is a floater. It's, it's a piece of debris that's floating in the vitreous humor of your eye. And flashes can be from a lot of things, um, but it's not something that I associate with optic neuritis. So thanks for asking. Zero night. Uh, double zero writes in. Hello, Dr. Boster. Well, hello, Zero Knight. Um, I have a question. Is taking vitamin C supplement a good idea or is it a bad thing to do? So I'm of the opinion that unless there's evidence um, or unless we see a deficiency, we don't want to just take lots of vitamins. And I think that taking a multivitamin once a day is a good idea. I have many videos on the channel that talk about the importance of taking vitamin D and I recommend D3. But I don't think that there's evidence that taking high-dose vitamin C uh, is particularly helpful in MS. Now, I'm not saying that it's harmful, uh, but I don't know that it's helpful. And I personally wouldn't recommend people taking lots of extra vitamin C just to take it. Some people think that vitamin C might augment the immune response, like, like beef up your immune system. And I don't think it does that. But if it did, that would be bad for MS because we don't want to rev up uh, the immune response. At any rate, um, I wouldn't uh, shy away from taking a multivitamin once a day. I wouldn't, if I had MS, shy away from taking uh, D3. 
Uh, and I would do that with the supervision of my treating clinician or doc. Um, but I wouldn't recommend taking high doses of vitamin C just as is. So Robert Dunkel writes, can MS impact your vision uh, with no visible damage to the optic nerve? Yes. And so the optic nerve is really long. I mean, well, I, I guess it's consider it being long. And there's a front half called the anterior portion and a bottom or a back half called the posterior portion. And some of the features of optic neuritis are not present if you have a a, a farther back piece of the optic nerve that's been impacted. So you might have some problems that you can't see with traditional testing. Also, the back of the eye uh, called the retinal nerve fiber layer is this uh, back of the eye and it's not supposed to thin out. And so in healthy adults, it barely thins out ever. You literally lose a couple microns in, in your lifetime. A micron's really thin. In MS, you can have massive dropout of your retinal nerve fiber layer. And this can happen without optic neuritis at all. And it correlates with brain atrophy and with disability. And so for several reasons, yes, Robert, you can have vision that gets impacted without uh, clear classic findings um, damage to the optic nerve. There's another test called a VEP, visual evoked potential. And this is a test where they put stickies in the back of your head for an EEG. And then they show you a changing pattern that you stare at. And it measures the speed of conduction. And so you might not have uh, obvious visual damage to the optic nerve on, on exam testing, but you could see that the retinal nerve fiber layer is bad with OCT or abnormal VEP, as I just described, where you'll see a slowing. And so those are some tests that we frequently do if the person with MS is saying they're having some eye problems and then we can't find evidence on exam to further ferret out what might be going on. Um, hope that wasn't a convoluted answer. Thank you for asking, Robert. So there's 119 people online. This is awesome. Uh, you guys know that it's uh, MS Awareness Month, and I'm committed to jumping online to do live streams as much as possible. If that sounds awesome to you, please give it a thumbs up. Um, you can click a th the thumbs up button at the bottom, and uh, I would really appreciate it. And let me know that you're digging what we're doing right now. Megan D writes in, um, I'd love to see a video discussing how, when to go to apply for disability. So that's a major, major topic. Um, Megan, I, I think that this can be very, very challenging. And before we apply for disability, I think that we have to work on adaptations and accommodations. If you haven't worked with an occupational therapist, they're awesome. And they work uh, on uh, optimizing your occupation. Now, they do way more than that. They work on any activity of daily living. But they can help you come up with adaptations to be more successful in the workplace um, or at home or, or through a multitude of, of activities that you have to do in your life. So my first comment is I would start with an occupational therapist. My second comment is if I'm really struggling in the workplace despite accommodations, the next step in my mind is to get neuropsychometric testing, so neuropsych testing to really, really understand the details, breadth and depth of your cognition, thinking and memory. And if there's MS that's been impacting it, it'll show up. And I think it's important to get a functional capacity examination. Now, a functional capacity examination is typically done by a physical medicine doctor or sometimes by physical therapists. And what it does is it really characterizes your full functionality. You know, can you balance on one foot? How, how long can you hold something in the air, et cetera, et cetera. And those two pieces of information really help inform um, the limits that we might have with working. And if, in fact, uh, MS is such that we're not going to be able to work. And I think those are really important before you apply for disability, because applying for disability is super challenging. And having evidence from your clinic notes sometimes really doesn't suffice and oftentimes doesn't suffice. And so collecting neuropsychometric data um, through uh, formal testing and uh, getting a functional capacity exam, I think are really important steps. So I hope that helps. So Deborah writes in, hi, Dr. B. Well, hello, Deborah. Thank you for all that you do. Uh, I'm on Tysabri and I want to know if MS still progresses, but at a slower pace and will it help some of the cognitive issues that I experience? Well, Deborah, I appreciate your watching the channel and thank you for the question. Tysabri, in my opinion, uh, is a highly effective drug. I think it's one of the top three drugs that are currently available in the United States. It's an infusion that you take once a week and I have several videos on my channel talking about Tysabri.
Uh, Tysavri does slow progression. Uh, when you look at the Tysavri trials, uh, the first trial that I'll mention is called the Affirm trial. And in the Affirm trial, Tysavri was compared against placebo. And this was in relapsing patients. And Tysavri significantly slowed uh, the progression of disability compared to placebo. Now, there's a more uh, recent trial called the ASCEND trial. And this was in secondary progressive patients. Now, they gave uh, people with secondary progressive MS either Tysabri or placebo, and they said the trial failed, but it didn't. It, it failed technically in, uh, in improving uh, the EDSS, which is really a walking scale. But what it did was it slowed the decline of hand function. So it actually preserved hand function, uh, again, Tysabri, and that was in a progressive state. So I do think that there's really good evidence that it slows progression, yes. I also think there's good evidence that Tysabri improves cognition. So being on a disease modifying therapy is a really important thing to do to uh, maintain an optimized cognition. And I think there's excellent data that supports Tysabri's ability to do that. So yes to both. So uh, Tammy writes in, I'm a physician. I got the flu shot. Immediately had uh, acute symptoms as soon thereafter, bizarre neurological symptoms comma MS. Have you ever had patients report vaccine-related demyelination? So hello, Tammy. Uh, nice to meet you. And yes, there's a phenomenon uh, called ADEM, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. So acute meaning now, disseminated meaning it's not just in one location, encephalo meaning brain, myelitis meaning spinal cord, itis meaning inflammation. So that's a really long-winded way, ADEM, of saying a really bad presentation that's like MS, affecting the brain, the spinal cord, optic nerves, and it all happens at the same time. And we think that it's triggered by either infection or vaccination. Now, um, I am a big believer in the importance of vaccines. I am a, I'm an immunologist. I'm a neuroimmunologist. Um, and, I, and I believe firmly that vaccines are terribly important. And I never, ever want to give uh, a, a suggestion that I think differently. Um, I am not telling people to shy away from vaccines. Uh, it is extremely uncommon to see this. And vaccines uh, prevent uh, things that can kill us. So I don't want to give that impression. But uh, yes, there is uh, a linkage between having either an infection or a vaccination potentially triggering ADEM. Uh, and so uh, likely that can be sorted out by a series of MRIs and maybe lumbar puncture as part of the diagnostic workup. I hope that you're doing okay, uh, and I hope that you've sought medical attention. I bring that up. You say you're a physician. Um, sometimes docs aren't very good at going to the doctor, and so I certainly hope that you've gotten this looked into so that you can thrive and be the best you can be for you and your family and your patients. Next question from Keith. Um, I would like to have all 125 new friends on this live chat. Uh, oh no, he says, I feel like I have 125 plus new friends on these live chats. Keith, the feeling is mutual. Uh, there's 137 people online right now um, from all over the globe. And as you read through the comments, people are really like, like joining us from everywhere. Uh, and I feel the same way. I feel like this is a global village, a global online community, and it's awesome. So Keith, I'm right there with you. So Deborah writes, EMG will tell if it's carpal tunnel or rule it out. Uh, that's correct. An EMG is a useful test for understanding the peripheral nervous system. Now, MS involves the brain and spinal cord, optic nerves, the central nervous system. An EMG teaches us about the peripheral nervous system, the other part of the nervous system, um, the neuromuscular junction where the nerves come off the spinal cord, the nerves that travel from the spinal cord down the limb, uh, the interaction between the nerve and the muscle, all of these are part of the peripheral nervous system. And the muscle is also part of the peripheral nervous system. And the EMG teaches us about that. It's not very useful in diagnosing MS, but sometimes we need to get an EMG to rule out peripheral things. And so I think there is a value in that regard. So um, Sean Meboy writes, Pepsi or Coke, laugh out loud. Now, I think Shawnee Boy was trying to make a joke, you know, Pepsi or Coke, uh, but I actually want to answer that. So historically, when I was a kid, I was a Coke guy, loved a, a Coca-Cola, but I have stopped drinking soda. 
Um, I stopped drinking soda completely. And I think that soda is, is not good for me. Uh, there's a lot of sugar in general soda. And the diet versions have a lot of chemicals that trick you into thinking that something's sweet, but they provide absolutely no nutritional value. Um, and so I found that I was drinking almost only soda for a period of my life. And I don't think that was a good decision. Uh, so I actually would say neither. Um, as many of you know, I love carbonated water. This is just some uh, water in, in the place that we're staying at. I love myself some coffee. Um, and those are my uh, beverages of choice. So Debbie Bell writes in Mich Michigan here, uh, can I strengthen my foot to drive with a brace? This is a very important question. So I, I wanna uh, really approach this question from several different ways, Debbie. First of all, in the United States, if you get a driver's license, there's no process that checks whether or not you're allowed to keep driving, except for when you renew your license. And you can have um, a, uh, a problem like MS, where you're having difficulties moving your arms or legs, let's say, and there's nothing that checks you and says, oh, you're not allowed to drive. It's really on you to ask yourself a very important question. Do I feel safe behind the wheel? Am I having problems? And you need to be really honest with yourself because if you're having problems driving, you could kill yourself or you could kill the, the family in the car next to you. Nobody wants that. So I want to first call out the fact that you bringing this up is really um, impressive to me. Good job. Because what you're saying is I, I'm, I'm concerned about myself, my safety, my family's safety. I'm concerned about my community, and I don't want to put anybody in danger in case I have some trouble. So thank you. The second thing I want to say is, is that there are ways to rehabilitate and to create adaptive driving environments if you have problems from MS or other things. And again, I'll give a shout out to occupational therapy. We at Ohio Health, where I work, use occupational therapists a lot. And one of the things that I love them for, I love them for a lot of reasons, is because they can do driving evaluations. They'll literally take someone in a car, like a physical car, and, um, and they can learn things that they're having trouble doing and then come up with adaptations uh, to make it better, including things like hand controls. And so I would 100 million percent recommend that, Debbie, that you seek out an occupational therapist because an OT driving evaluation can really, really help. If you're not safe driving, they can help you either A, figure out what can make you safe or B, help you realize ah, this is not going to be a good idea. Um, the last thing I'll say is that I, I think that you have to be very careful wearing a brace. Uh, I've had situations where patients tried to wear a brace while driving and it got caught on the pedal or it got stuck and, and that can create really bad problems. So I would be very cautious about doing that. And I wouldn't want to use like a knee brace or an ankle foot orthosis or something unless I had worked this out with my occupational therapist. Awesome question, Debbie. Thank you. Before I move on, any of you on the live stream right now, um, leave a comment uh, about driving. Do you identify um, that you need adaptations to drive? Um, have you ever had any difficulties or concerns while driving? I'm just be curious uh, what you guys think, if this is common for folks uh, that are listening in or not. So another question from, uh, oh, no, that's not a question from Melanie. Sorry, guys. So Cy D writes in. Which DMT can be used for, for somebody who has been on a Baggio without negative effects uh, on the liver? So this is a good question. And Sai D, I have a video on a Baggio um, side effects and management. So if you haven't checked that out, that might be a good one to look at. But to answer your question, a Baggio uh, can impact the liver, but it doesn't mean that it does. And a very simple way to sort this outside is just to get liver enzymes. If you've had your liver enzymes checked and they're normal, I'm not concerned. That means that your body is metabolizing the abagio really without difficulties. And so as long as you had normal liver enzymes, I'm not viewing this as a major problem. Now, maybe Sai is asking the question because abagio lasts in the body for quite some time. So if you stop abagio, it's going to leave the body slowly over 18 to 24 months. But again, if uh, you were checking liver enzymes, even if there's a, a diminishing contribution of a Baggio being processed by the liver, we're going to check the liver enzyme and we're going to know if there's a problem. So I don't view this particular situation as a no-go or as a big barrier to starting the next medicine. 
Hope that helps. So uh, Deborah writes in venlafaxine with a question mark. So venlafaxine, V-E-N-L-O-F-O-X-I-N-E, is the generic name for Effexor, which is a antidepressant. So she just says venlafaxine question mark. So I'm going to interpret this question as can venlafaxine help depression in MS? And the answer is yes. Effexor is a solid uh, antidepressant. It's not one that I prefer only because it can have a pretty serious withdrawal phenomenon. When you stop it, a patient can go through withdrawal and it can be unpleasant. And so you never, ever want to stop Effexor cold turkey. You always want to taper off Effexor slowly with the supervision of your clinician so that you don't go through this withdrawal. Um, I'm not sure what else, uh, Deborah, you meant when you wrote venlafaxine question mark. So hopefully that helps address your question. There's 135 people online right now. We've been doing this for about 35 minutes. That's awesome. Um, there's 81 thumbs up. Thank you guys. Uh, again, it's uh, MS Awareness Month, and so I'm jumping online as much as I can to try to help answer your questions, to educate, to energize, to try to empower folks uh, impacted by MS. So the next question is from Kimberly, and Kimberly writes, hi, doctor. Well, hello, Kimberly. Um, thank you from Vancouver. Vancouver's on my list. I would really like to go to Vancouver sometime. I'm wondering how to get uh, my doctor and others in my life to take seriously the mental health aspects I'm having. How serious um, are the effects of stress? So that's two separate questions, both really good questions. So the first question is, how do I get my doctor and my village members to understand the mental health aspects of MS? So people with MS are twice as likely to suffer from depression. People with MS are more likely to, to suffer from anxiety. Um, people with MS are at risk of social isolation. There's a lot that can go on. So much of MS is invisible and honey, you look so good. I, I can't stand that. And yet it's a really big problem. So one of the ways that we can do that is by being candid about our feelings and sharing um, that when you're struggling and you have to trust the village member, you have to trust the physician. Another way to do that, honestly, is to talk to a psychiatrist. Psychiatrists are experts at, at mental health. They're really good at managing it, and they're wizards when it comes to addressing it with pharmacology and with therapy and other modalities. And so if you're having trouble getting your doctor and your village members to understand the mental health, you can go to a mental health expert who can then share with them, hey, look, he or she is really struggling from X or Y. Uh, another way to approach this is to work with a counselor. Um, and so seeing a trained listener psychiatrist, psychologist, social worker, rabbi, priest, etc., cetera, um, can be very helpful. Uh, working with them individually can give you uh, techniques and tips on how to talk to your loved ones, your village members, your doctor, specifically about these issues. And um, there's, there's couples counseling and family counseling. And depending on how difficult it is and how difficult the, the family dynamic is, sometimes it's super helpful and valuable to have, um, to have a family counseling session. So all food for thought. Now, the second question is how serious are the effects of stress? Now, nobody goes home at night and says, honey, let's get stressed out. That's not a conversation that people have. Nobody wants to become stressed. Um, that being said, um, there's uh, some research that suggests that stress may not impact MS, and I have trouble believing that research. I think that stressors, particularly big psychosocial stressors, getting married, divorced, moving, getting a raise, losing your job, losing a loved one, these are major, major things, and I certainly think they impact us. I think they can have impacts on the immune system, and I think sometimes in the setting of significant stress, we see an uptick of MS symptoms. I'm not saying it triggers an attack per se, but I do think that it can kick up MS symptoms. And so that's just my two cents uh, from being in clinical practice for a while now. All right, AJ's HR writes in. Oh, she and she's explaining it. AJ's explaining how you uh, give a thumbs up. So I'm gonna read this because I actually didn't know this. Uh, to click the thumbs up button, hit the X to the right uh, hand corner and then hit the thumb. Go back into the chat by clicking live chat. I didn't know that. Thank you. That's very cool. Listen to listening one, right? Um, and that question I'm going to skip. So Cindy writes, can you discuss alternative therapies such as acupuncture, hyperbaric oxygen chambers, et cetera? And yes, I can. So I'm an allopathic doctor. I'm an MD. 
And I was taught uh, how to use uh, allopathic medicines and lotions and potions to help people uh, with, with disease. If there's a, a treatment that's not part of the allopathic school of thought, then, then we call it alternative. Now, acupuncture is a great example because for MDs, acupuncture is considered alternative. But that doesn't make it not good. It just means we don't know very much about it. In China, acupuncture is a standard of care. And so here's my take on alternative therapies, given that I don't know lots about them. Number one, uh, there's, well, let me say this. There's three reasons, uh, three things that we have to consider when we're considering an alternative therapy. Number one, it can't be too expensive. So I'll use acupuncture as an example. I don't know how much acupuncture costs, but it, there's a cost and it's probably a reasonable cost, but each individual has to decide, is that too expensive for me? And I wouldn't want someone uh, taking out a second mortgage or not paying for food or not paying for a medicine that has been proven to work to do a alternative therapy. So it can't be too expensive. Number two, it can't be dangerous. So there are some alternative therapies that could hurt the body. And so we want to make sure that it's not dangerous. And that's actually a conversation I have a lot with my patients. We'll sometimes call in pharmacologists or pharmacists to look things up and try to figure out if there's danger in a given alternative therapy. And the third one is it can't be instead of something that I know works. So if you um, want to explore acupuncture and you can afford it, I don't think acupuncture is dangerous. I th I'm okay with that unless you say, well, Aaron, I'm going to stop my disease modifying therapy and instead do acupuncture. That I'm not okay with. But if you say, I'm going to do acupuncture, I can afford it. I don't think it's dangerous. And I'm going to continue my disease modifying therapy. I'm going to do both. That I'm okay with. So. Um, I hope that helps give you some guiding principles of how one might consider alternative therapies. We've been on for 41 minutes, guys. This is great. There's 124 people online right now. There's 109 thumbs up. Wow. Thank you, guys. Um, uh, this says to me that this is working and that this global online community um, is something that you're into as well. So thanks for the feedback. So another question. Well, I'm not going to say this name right, but I'm going to try uh, Yoandi, it's Y-O-A-N-D-E. So Yoandi, if I said that wrong, I'm sorry. Um, can you say hi to my, my friend's name? He's a big fan. Um, uh, his name is Nick Gurr. So I would love to. Nick Gurr, hello, howdy, hi. Uh, thank you very much for watching on the channel. Uh, and uh, your friend's cool. So hello, Nick. Connie writes in, if you think a 60-year-old should stop treatment, is that why my doctor said I'm too old to have MS? Neurologists want to wait a year. Okay, so that's that's a complicated question, and I don't have enough information to really weigh in. But I'm going to interpret the question talking about someone who is 60 years of age um, and questioning whether or not they may have MS. Now, the average age of onset for relapsing MS is 30, and the average age of onset of primary progressive MS is 40. So if you're 60 years old and having symptoms of MS, that's uh, 20 to 30 years older than typical. It doesn't mean it's impossible or the answer is no. It just means that it's atypical or unusual. In that situation, I wouldn't blame a doc that's going to take their time and make sure they have the diagnosis clear and that they're not mistaking it for something else. So I hope that helps answer the question. The whole discussion about stopping therapy at 60, which is something that I absolutely do not agree with. I do not agree with stopping therapy at 60. I think that's a really, really bad idea. That's something different. Um, and I have a video on that topic. Um, I, uh, if you haven't seen that, you might want to check that one out. Hey, Megan, you're not too late to the party. Um, thanks for joining us. Uh, next question is from Nikki, and Nikki says, amantadine for energy, question mark, question mark, thoughts? So amantadine is an antiviral medicine, which has been used in Parkinson's disease, and it turns out that for some people with MS, amantadine, taken twice a day, helps with energy. It's a relatively well-tolerated medicine. Sometimes there can be some issues with insomnia with it. Um, I, I haven't had great, great success with it. Um, oftentimes, uh, when I try it with people, I don't see they have robust results, but some people really respond really well to it. So there's all kinds of different medicines that we consider to help treat, 
um, fatigue associated with MS, and amantadine is one of them. Now, there's an interesting study that looked at an amino acid called levocarnitine or L-carnitor. And L-carnitor twice a day was compared head to head in a Pepsi Coke challenge with amantadine, and it did better than amantadine. Now, some people that I take care of respond to levocarnitine. Some people I take care of respond to amantadine. It requires a prescription, uh, and you, it's something worthwhile talking to your doc about. So next question. This is a good one. I just killed my water. So Dan McGee writes, benign MS, question mark. So Dan, I have a video on this question. Uh, does, does benign MS exist? And the answer is absolutely, I, I don't think so. Um, let me, let me uh, add a little more uh, discussion. MS is insidious and damage up front um, early on in the disease may not manifest itself, manifest itself for quite some time. And I think that we can be lulled into a sense of complacency, thinking that nothing's going on early on in the disease. I, I, I'm very bothered by that. And I see a lot of doctors make that huge error. Now, the definition of benign MS is an EDSS of less than, say, 2, 1.5, depends on the study, going out 10 to 15 years. So what they're saying is, is that you have very little disability on the EDSS scale going out 10, 15 years. The problem is, is that scale doesn't really look at arm and hand function very well. It doesn't look at uh, fatigue um, and it doesn't look at cognition very well. And that's the biggest thing. And so someone could have major problems with cognition and have an okay EDSS. I don't believe in benign MS. I don't think we're smart enough to be able to really figure out who truly has it and who doesn't. And I don't think we're smart enough in 2019 to say, if you have, quote, benign MS for 15 years, what's the last 15 years like? Because I have seen patients that had so-called benign MS for 10, 15 years, and then their disease got active. And so I dislike this term because I think it leads doctors and patients to not treating folks. Um, and this is my strong opinion. So I have an entire video where I talk about this in much more depth. Uh, and I think I'm a little uh, more eloquent in my discussion of it. If you'd like to check that out, Dan. Okay. I've gone through all 35 of the questions that I prepared. Um, I hope you guys like them. And as I said earlier, if you uh, would please write in your questions in the, in the comments right now, I'm going to go through them and I'll use them to answer next time. Uh, it's been 47 minutes. There's 131 people online. That's super awesome. I want to say thank you to so many of you supporting me um, and encouraging me to keep this channel going. Uh, you know, it's my full intention that I'm going to be putting out a video at least once a week, um, sometimes more often than that. Uh, and after March is over, I don't think I'll be live streaming every opportunity that I have, but I certainly want to live stream at least once a month, probably more frequently than that. Um, my name is Aaron Boster, and thank you for learning about MS with me. Uh, it's MS Awareness Month, and I love this growing online community. I, I love what we've done together, guys, and I want to thank you all. Have a great rest of your weekend. Have a super Saturday night. Take care until my next video or live stream.